Today we have a real Canadian. <laughs> I have to begin with a word of sincere thanks and gratitude to Phil Ziegler in particular, also to my uh, partner in crime, um, Kate Dugan, for putting together such a marvelous con uh, conference. Uh, the organization, the speakers invited, this has just been a tremendous event and we owe it, a lot of it to Phil. Like Christophe Chalamet, Phil has been a friend of the Center for BART Studies here in Princeton for a very long time. Uh, he has participated in many of our events, most recently organizing a conference on Marcus BART's theology just last fall. Uh, he is the author of several books, but I want to draw particular attention because it's relevant to the topic of this conference to the book that came out last year, Militant Grace which, um, although it is sold out upstairs, is still available for order. It's about the apocalyptic turn in theology, uh, the relevance of um, Pauline studies in particular for what uh, Christian systematic theologians should be thinking and doing. And uh, it is also, I, I would say, politically very relevant to the times in which we live. Um, it's food for the mind and the soul at the same time, so I encourage you to uh, pick that up. Um, Phil is the secretary of the Karl Barth Society of North America. He's involved in many, many things, and the fact that he can also find time to organize conferences for us, I think, is a real gift. So, Phil, thank you, and come to, please come to the podium and uh, share your thoughts with us. This paper is in aid of winning some initial orientations to the task of conceiving what a contemporary dogmatic treatment of the devil might involve and what shape it might take. Yeah, that's weird. Um, <laughs> the need to take theological responsibility for this troubling tract of Christian teaching is particularly enjoined upon those of us who, having been taken to school again in recent years on the Apostle Paul, not least by the labors of many of the biblical scholars in this room, now have to think afresh about the three-agent drama of redemption at the heart of Paul's eschatological gospel. For the telos of the effective advent of grace upon God's people is that the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet, as the apostle puts it with particular sharpness. If salvation is won by God's grace in Jesus Christ for creatures handed over and captive to sin, creatures bound in Adam, creatures subjected to futility of the body of death, in short, if salvation comes for creatures who are under the dominion of the devil, then our soteriology must think and speak aptly of the nature and activities of the anti-God power. Now, it's arguable that Karl Barth's theology includes within its wide scope and achievements a self-conscious effort to think and to speak aptly of the old enemy. Much is, of course, compressed into that little word, aptly. Questions of hermeneutics, epistemology, ontology and language, together with matters of dogmatic architecture and proportion, among other considerations. For purposes of this particular paper, I would like to concentrate on two aspects only. The first concerns what we might call the dogmatic location of the question of the devil as it's asked and answered. The second question concerns the peculiar conception of the nature of the third agent as Bart conceives of it. Let me briefly suggest something of what's at issue in both these aspects. Um, in lectures that glossed the Apostles' Creed, published in 1935, Bart remarks that the mystery of sin, evil, and death could be concentrated into the question about the possibility which the devil had and has to be the devil. He goes on to suggest that rather than attempting to explain all this with consistent reference to God's omnipotence and the positive will of the creator, it would be better to acknowledge the impossible possibility of the mysterium iniquitatis and for dogmatics at this point to, to be, as he says, logically inconsistent precisely in order to do justice to the very peculiar subject matter at hand. Crucially, that this is so, Bart concludes, cannot be apprehended on the basis of the doctrine of creation as such, but only on the basis of the grace of God revealed and encountered in Jesus Christ. Now, Bart's brief observations here reflect our two leading concerns. The first is that the doctrine of creation does not, of itself, furnish the necessary framework within which to confront the question of the devil taken here as the apotheosis, as it were, of sin, death, and evil, but rather that Christology and so also the doctrine of salvation must do so. This thought, as we shall see, is baked into the architecture of the church dogmatics and proves very important to, to, to the treatment of our theme. 
when we ask about the dogmatic location of the question of the devil, we find that Barth's treatment of the theme in the dogmatics is notably distributed, we might say. Traditionally, discussion of the devil often finds its place primarily in the context of the doctrine of creation, animated as it is by concerns about originary dualism, discussion of human temptation and fall, and in the context of angelology. Set as it is within volume three of the Church Dogmatics, the concentrated discussion of nothingness in paragraph 50, volume 3.3, is indeed closely related to Barth's thinking about creation and providence, being intimately connected to his earlier discussion of the exegesis of Genesis 1 in volume 3.1, as well as to the brief treatment of angels uh, later in 3.3 in particular. So, so far, so traditional. Yet, the material novelty of Barth's exegesis of Genesis 1-2 as well as his repudiation of the tr traditional account of the fall of the angels, already put him at odds with much traditional thinking on this score. But much more than this, Barth's doctrine of creation as a whole is made strange, as it were, by his decision to construe it fundamentally as the outer basis of the covenant, for which divine election provides the inner basis. Election and salvation, thus, already provide the essential grammar with which Bart thinks and speaks of creation itself. And so the question of the devil is caught up in all of this, and its treatment imports and integrates the logic of saving grace from Barth's discussion of election and reconciliation, or indeed, as he puts it once, from the heart of the gospel itself. Second, Barth's 1935 remarks also suggest that in order to think after the devil, theology must be rendered logically inconsistent in his phrase. The adequation of thought and discourse to this problem involves frank admission and embrace of the impossibility of rational adequation. This suggests that treatment of the problem of the devil will, of necessity, be marked by forms of conceptual description and argument which themselves manifest the absurdity of their object by way of their own inconsistency and even perhaps incoherence. This is more than making a virtue out, out of a necessity. It is, a, it is a specific dogmatic discipline not to afford reason, sense, and purpose where there is and can be none. This too, as we shall see, is a crucial aspect of Barth's handling of the theme of the third agent in the dogmatics. Yet even where there is no consistent explanation of evil possible, a certain kind of circumscription can and must be ventured. Barth's discussion of the ontological peculiarity of the third agent is radical and radically revisionist in many respects, precisely in its commitment to the curious thirdness of the third agent. Worked out as it is under the controlling rubric of Das Nichtige, nothingness, um, the devil is neither God nor creature, but an absurd and inimical other. As we shall see, Bard is relentless in his refusal to afford evil any positive ontological status or ratio within any ordered reality, divine or creaturely. But is he relentless enough, I ask? Much of the difficulty of his account lies precisely in the conceptual and linguistic discipline and creativity involved in, in his attempt to do justice to the demands of representing the virulent, annihilating thirdness in discourse. Two further brief introductory remarks. First, Bart's handling of this theme raises important and more general questions about the limitations of system in theology, I think. As he himself says, discussion of this topic involves, quote, an extraordinarily clear demonstration of the, necess of the necessary brokenness of all theological thought and utterance. It is broken thought and utterance to the extent that it can progress only in isolated thoughts and statements directed from different angles. It can never form a system, comprehending and, as it were, seizing the object or strain after completeness. Put in a positive way, we might say that Bart wrestles with this theme in a way that exercises, perhaps with peculiar kind of acuity, his distinctive dog dogmatics or dogmatic poetics, what uh, Miskota memorably characterized as Bart's capacity for repetition, execution, and internal connection in the flow of inexhaustible eloquence, all set in the service of a multidimensional truth, which is never simply a given. Miskota himself had some of the same virtues, I think. Finally, we, we might ask as a last consideration at the outset just what all this has to do with eschatology. Among the insightful claims of Wolf Kritka's important study on sin and nothingness in the theology of Karl Barth is the claim that the problem of nothingness 
ought, as he says, formally to have been set in the context of eschatology from the outset, because it is, in fact, already treated materially within the horizon of the doctrine of election. For Bart, the question of nothingness is, in fact, framed eschatologically, precisely when it is framed with reference to election as the sum and substance of the eschatological gospel of God. If the gospel is the good news that the Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil, then Burkhauer was right to see that because it is broached evangelically, the question of sin, death, and the devil for Bart can only be asked in one way, and that is, over what does grace triumph? With this talk of grace's triumph, Burkhauer too acknowledged that the matter of nothingness was for Bart, one that must inevitably be framed in an eschatological way. As Bart himself wrote already in, in the 1920s, reflecting on 1 Corinthians 15, the text that we, we were th thinking of with Susan this morning, and this is the first citation on, your, on the handout. Bart says, last things as such are not last things, however great and significant they may be. He only speaks of last things who would speak of the end of all things, of their end understood plainly and fundamentally, of a reality so radically superior to all things, that the existence of all things would be utterly and entirely based upon it alone, and thus, in speaking of their end, he would in truth be speaking of nothing else than their beginning, an evocation of the theme with which the conference began so winsomely on Sunday evening. Throughout the dogmatics, Bart specifies this ultimate reality with which all things take their beginning and find their end as Jesus Christ. His chief eschatological concern, as we've discovered throughout the conference, is thus with the eschatos, and only thereafter and therein with the eschata, which is to say that his theology is preoccupied with Jesus Christ as the first and the last and the living one. To frame the question of nothingness and evil eschatologically is to frame it with persistent reference to the triumphant reality and purposes of God revealed and realized in Jesus Christ. Bart's axiomatic claim that, as he writes, real nothingness is that which brought Jesus Christ to the cross and that which he defeated there. This claim frames Bart's treatment of the question of the inimical third agent in and as an eschatological claim in precisely this Christological sense. And so the paper unfolds in three sections, as you'll see on the handout. In the first, I examine the distilled account that Bart offers of Das Nichtica in paragraph 50. I look to draw out there what's involved in thinking and speaking of the adversary as a third thing, which is antithetical to both God and creature. In the second section, I venture a concise discussion of what you might call the distribution of Bart's teaching about the adversary across the doctrines of election and creation and reconciliation, and the particular contours that it wins from being developed in quite this way. A final section ventures some hesitant observations concerning the significance of Bart's discussion for what and what might be learned from it. So, um, sex, section two, das, das Nictica, the distilled and dynamic enmity of the devil. In paragraph 50 of the Church Dogmatics, Bart ventures an intense summary statement of the nature, agency, and purposes of that to which God ultimately says no in the divine acts of election, creation, and salvation, an unreality that he styles here, Das Nictica. Though regularly and rightly read in conjunction with Bart's doctrine of sin, unfolded across the later doctrine of reconciliation in volume four, this material also relates directly to the concluding section of paragraph 51 on demonology as a kind of annex. For our purposes, after some swift restatement of Bart's discussion of nothingness, we will concentrate on its outworking in the annex, where it gives shape, if that's quite the right word, to Bart's Satanology. Amidst the field of creaturely occurrence, there is opposition to God's providential preservation, concurrence, and rule in general, and to God's salutary work of election, creation, and salvation in particular. The occurrence of stubborn resistance to God is, for Bart, inexplicable with reference to God as such or with reference to the creature as such. God's lordship and the positive meaning of creaturely freedom simply preclude it. So it appears, when it appears, as an alien factor inimical to and arrayed against both God and creature, objectively manifest in the disruption and shattering of the relationship between them. This alien factor Bart calls nothingness, delineating it from the negative aspects and the shadow side of the good creation as such. Indeed, Bart suggests that our impatience with and bad faith towards the latter, that is the shadow side of creation, um, tempts us 
wrongly to mistake it for true nothingness, the true nothingness that threatens the whole of creation as its menacing frontier. No phenomenology of the negative, but solely attending to the knowledge of Jesus Christ promises to disclose the nature of this enemy. What is thus disclosed in the history of the word made flesh, Bart of Ears, is an adversary that is neither God nor creature, insubstantial, alien, yet invasively present and active within creation. Nothingness is utterly antithetical to both God and creature, or, as Bart stresses, better, primarily and supremely to God, and so also therefore and thereby to the creature. The most concrete circumscriptions of nothingness are those which speak in the sharpest Christological register. So Bart can write that this nothingness is just, quote, that which rendered necessary the birth of his son in the stable of Bethlehem and his death upon the cross of Calvary, that which by his birth and death he smote, defeated, and destroyed, or again, of the reality on account of which and against which God himself willed to become a creature in the creaturely world yielding and subjecting himself to it in Jesus Christ in order to overcome it. In short, nothingness is, as I said above, that which brought Jesus Christ to the cross and that which he defeated there. When delineated strictly in this way, it's clear that Das Nithika is not the negation, ingredient indifference, neither is it the antithesis that drives any conceptual di dialectics, nor is it coextensive with the privation of creaturely being i.e. with non-being as such. While all such negative factors can and are weaponized, as it were, by nothingness, so too are the positives involved in identity, synthesis, and being. The entirety of, creature, the entirety of creaturely reality can be seized and deflected away from and against God under the alien power of nothingness as it takes concrete shape in the manifold forms of human sin. But Bart is at pains to stress that nothingness is not exhausted, his word, in our sin. Rather, our fallenness is itself, a, again in his phrase, a surrender to the alien power of an adversary that disturbs and injures and destroys the creature and its nature. The negation of nothingness is an assault, an aggression, an, er, an eruption, an interruption, the annihilating animus of death and the virulent and destructive dynamic of evil with which the creature cannot cope, as Bart says. Nothingness has a dynamic all of its own. Bart stresses again and again that it is sheer power, a power which invades and subjects and carries the creature away captive, he writes, so that he is wholly and utterly lost in the face of it. So, so much for its form, but what about its reality? Bart emphasizes, as I've said, that it is neither God nor God's creature, rather, in an arresting phrase, he says, we must accept the fact that in a third way of its own, nothingness is. And any and all accounts which would deny or diminish or minimize this is are untenable from the Christian standpoint, as he puts it. With this, the wicket gets particularly sticky. Not only is nothingness known only in contradiction by God, but being in create, this contradiction by God is its only ground that to which it owes itself, as Bart puts it. It exists, as it were, purely on and by God's left hand, solely as the object of God's potent non-willing or unwilling. It is as, uh, as God renounces and abandons it in his acts of positive willing. Or as Bart says again, it lives only by the fact that it is that which God does not will, but it does live by this fact. It is, as he says later, the real only by reason of the opus dei alienum, the alien work of God, the divine negation and rejection. And he points at this point to the text of Genesis 1-2, to which we shall return. Nothing in all creation corresponds to God's potent willing against, and so the being of nothingness is uniquely improper, improper to it, an inherent contradiction and impossible possibility. Alien and adverse to grace, nothingness just is evil an absolute enmity whose power threatens the salvation and right of the creature, but which primarily and supremely, again, Bart stresses, contests the honor and right of God. The concrete outworking of its adversity has occurred at the very heart of the gospel, which is to say, in Jesus Christ, Bart writes. And so nothingness is known to faith as something routed and extirpated because Jesus is victor. Bart deploys a range of both spatial and temporal tropes to render this claim. 
Nothingness is to us as a frontier, as something which has been excluded or bypassed, something which remains aside, while yet absurdly threatening to break back into the creation from out with. Or again, in temporal terms, nothingness is something that has passed behind us, something consigned to an unrepeatable past, left behind, and yet, bizarrely, still threatening to reemerge in the present and future. So this tension, past and excluded, yet both present and present, is the ontological impossibility of Das Nichtige. And the eruption of such paradoxical talk is an apt indication that the language that was made fit for speaking of creation is here overreaching. Um, in Kritka's useful summary restatement then, nothingness is antithetical in relation to the divine will and human flourishing and anhypostatic in relation to both divine and creaturely being, having no proper being of its own. To this, I would add that nothingness is also a-rational and a-teleological. It is without reason or sense. Circumscribed in this way, nothingness is inimical, parasitic, chaotic, and pointless. Now, as noted above, Bart offers only the most de delimited direct discussion of the devil at the conclusion of paragraph 51. Here too, discourse is necessarily indirect, becoming most intense precisely in the greatest proximity to talk of God's eschatological purpose and action. For the shape of the opposition, as it were, is made manifest just where it pitches itself, hopelessly yet viciously, against the principal works of divine saving grace. Those works, election, creation, reconciliation. A approached on this basis, Bart suggests that nothingness also takes the form of the evil one, he writes one that stands in sinister conflict against the creature and its creator. Or as he says elsewhere, as a real devil with his legions. Real here meaning, as Bart stresses, total opposition to the totality of God's creation. The contours of nothingness are thus also those of the devil, whose origin and nature lies in nothingness, Bart writes. We might think of the devil, I think here, as a kind of self-organizing intensity of evil. And so, too, its ontological status. The devil is non-divine and anti-divine, Bart says, and Bart also denies the devil's creaturely status, rejecting thereby what he calls the serious, if ancient, confusion that would rank the devil within the genus of angel. Excluded, rejected, null and void, yet they are. They are improperly under God's left hand. They are, for the devil is legion. Bart's emphasis that the devil is nothingness in its dynamic to the extent that it has form and power and movement and activity, or is a nexus of form and power, always usurpatious, on the march, invading, attacking, and so on. Essential to all of this is a tyrannical enmity and enterprising falsehood that mimics and parodies both God and the world to disastrous effect. Any form that nothingness wins, it finds only in a negative reflection of Christology and salvation, Bart claims in the same salutary encounter that discloses and disarms and defeats it. Um, Bart gave a radio interview late in life. It's included in the new Conversations volumes, which came from the translation seminar here into English not long since. And this is citation two on, on your handout. Bart was asked directly uh, in the interview two questions, one about angels and one about the devil. This is, this is what he says about the devil uh, at citation two. Um, I must confess, he says, that I know so little of the devil that I cannot give a definition of him. Uh, I know the effects of his existence, but I have never met him in person, as Luther did. So I find it is asking too much to give some kind of definition. Perhaps the devil is even the being who cannot be defined because of his nature, because he is the devil. He certainly is not a creature of God. He can only be, perhaps, the reason of the unreasonableness of sin. The devil is, as I like to say, the impossible possibility that cannot be defined. Later that same year, in an interview for Youth magazine, the youth seemed interested in the devil in the late 1960s, Bart reiterated his view that Satan is the impossible possibility not created by God and as such and is remains inexplicable. What, what he says there, it remains a reality outside the system. I take Bart to suggest that we might only be able to know and speak of the devil by way of a kind of demonic variation on Melanchthon's slogan, to know Christ is to know his benefits. To know the devil is to know his detriments. Because the devil only is in the event of murderous contradiction of God and creature. Like, the metaphors are hard, um, like a crushing vacuum. 
You, know, you, you can put a vacuum in a can and you, you can crush it with nothing. Or an empty lie, which is nothing but has a devastating consequence. Strictly speaking, we might do well on such a view not to think of the devil as an agent, as this would suggest a kind of coherent purpose or aim or will that Bart denies. Perhaps better to abide by an impersonal or anti-personal grammar at just this point. The devil is an event of nothingness in its seizure of power and chaotic reign. As a kingdom of nothingness, it is illegitimate, transient, improper, futile. The relentless uh, dynamism of its antithetical and hypostasis is reflected in the Petrine word that like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Predation is its only modus operandi, and predation also exhausts its modus ascendi, if that be allowed. Shark-like, the devil moves and feeds, else it succumbs to its own nullity. So with that, to section three, uh, an ancient and persistent enmity. As we've seen, nothingness generally, and the adversary in whom its destructive power is distilled in particular, come into view only in their fateful contradiction to God's concrete, salutary willing and doing. They are in this opposition. Thinking from the concrete defeat of nothingness on the cross, then Bart, as it were, pushes the theme back into the doctrines of election and creation, and then presses it forward into the doctrine of reconciliation. Some very brief representative examples of this will have to, to suffice, but I think the phenomena you could track more fully um, if you had time and space. So first, within the context of Bart's doctrine of election, the devil makes its most notable appearance in the opening pages of his consideration of the determination of the rejected. It's paragraph 35, part four. Alongside and with the elect are those who unfathomably continue to go on, as Bart says, living as Satan's prisoner. That is to say, the, the rejected. The determination of the rejected is wholly unlike that of the elect, arising instead from God's, uh, from, from God's almighty, holy, and compassionate non-willing, and like nothingness itself, the rejected are placed only, quote, at the, uh, as the object of the divine unwilling. The, the relation in view here is, again, asymmetrical, antithetical, and we might even say anhypostatic, inasmuch as Bart stresses that the rejected have no independent existence, but only exist, as he says, in an improper and dependent being with the elect. Indeed, as he continues, it is because the elect are that the rejected also are. This is because God has initiated the covenant of grace as the beginning of all his works and ways, precisely in order to destroy the rule of Satan, as Bart puts it, over humankind, thus opposing the kingdom of Jesus Christ to Satan in triumphant superiority. The frequency with which you find talk of Satan when you go hunting for it in the dogmatics is striking. No established and tolerated kingdom of Satan, Bart says, can stand in proportion or parallel to the reign of Christ. For the rejection of humankind is born eternally and therefore for all time, such that it, it is the rejection which is rejected, as Bart puts it. Bart characterizes the rejected in an idiom that clearly echoes the vocabulary of nothingness avant le temps, as it were. Remember, we're in volume 2-2. Two, two. Uh, rejection is not willed, and so improper, sinister, threatening, intolerably disordered, solely a determination past and behind us, like a shadow, he says, that yields and dissolves and dissipates. This uh, particular kind of rhetorical package of terms repeats time and again. The creature subjected to the adversary is assimilated to its chaotic form, in other words, coming to share in the illogic of nothingness, though never so as to escape from God's grace. Indeed, God issues an absolute no to nothingness precisely in order to wrest the creature from captivity to its inimical power. The concrete rejection of the rejection in Jesus Christ is precisely this absolute divine no, addressed to the rule of the enemy for the sake of God's yes to the creature. And Bart explains it this way. This is citation three on the, on the handout. The, the decision, he says, about nothingness of the rejected's negative act has been eternally made in Jesus Christ. It is precisely to him that God's choice has given that which was inaccessible to him and undeserved by him, and more, that which he has positively rejected, the grace of God. This grace is for him, the enemy of God, in spite of his enmity and in spite of his ne negative act, rejecting his representation of himself as rejected, forgiving his sins as the justification of the godless. From eternity, God knows that everyone to be this enemy, and so runs the testimony of the community, 
In Jesus Christ, God has known and loved and chosen and drawn eternally to himself this very one. In his shameful and wretched isolation, implicated in the sinful fall of Adam and enslaved to Adam's nature. In short, we could say, God's primal encounter with nothingness owes itself to the primal decision that God concretely made in Jesus Christ, such that nothingness emerges, as Kirke puts it, as God's own problem from the very first. Bart remarks intriguingly here that if we were to seek to ground this divine election otherwise than in the love of God, and so in circumvention of the concrete will actually fulfilled in Christ, we would be seeking to plumb, what he calls, a supposedly greater depth in God, and that undoubtedly means nothingness, or rather the depth of Satan, end, end quote. This claim is an arresting one, though I think explicable in the terms of our discussion. All that is not God's concrete determination to love and so to save is strictly that which is not willed by God. And as such, its realization, here, even only as the putative condition of possibility for the work of election, would be inimical to what God does concretely will, namely, to be in Christ the electing God and the one elected to be rejected for the sake of others. Bart's thinking here seems redolent of the logic of Christ's own repudiation of Peter's refusal to abide by the divine will driving him to Jerusalem and so to the cross, which culminates in the great uh, declaration, get behind me, Satan. It is the work of the adversary to subvert the concrete identity and activity of God. Here in the case of election, as Bart styles it, by way of a corrosive hypothetical speculation that would call into question the eschatological lordship of love. We might say that for Bart, the counterfactual is satanic. Now this emphasis on the diabolical power of that which God does not will continues within Bart's doctrine of creation. Um, where the undisputed focus of his discussion of nothingness is his gloss on Genesis 1-2. Bart examines in this verse, in this verse and its wider setting uh, on the basis that its genre is, as was well known, a history-like saga forged by divination and poetry, and, as noted above, treats the creation as an event that corresponds to salvation, and which thus uh, salvation supplies its def depth grammar. Our interest concentrates on Bart's discussion of the act of creation in relation to the notorious tohu wabohu, that dark and formless void or abyss of which Genesis 2, 1, 2 speaks. Now, denying interpretations that would make it either a reality independent of God and his work or uh, would style it as God's proto-creation, Bart instead suggests that there is a third possibility. This is to take verse two to speak of that which is excluded, as he says, from all present and future existence, which is to say the chaos, the world fashioned otherwise than according to the divine purpose, and therefore formless and intrinsically possible. Or again, that which is absolutely without basis or future, utter darkness, and so the abyss of that which is intrinsically impossible. The divine act of creation is construed here as the bypassing or setting aside of everything that God does not will, or more firmly, as the separation of the good creation from the sterile chaos taken by Bart to be the possibility God's creative decision ignored and despised. The possibility of a, word of a world, as he puts it, of evil, sin, the fall, and all its consequences. Bart appeals to uh, Zimmerli's description of this as the nothing, which is destroyed by God's creative act. And he does so in support of the claim that what is in view here is the world which according to God's Revelation was, as he puts it, neglected, rejected, ignored, left behind by the actual creation in an utterance of God's word, which is the eruption and re revelation of divine compassion, the idea that creation is an act of divine compassion. Now, the small print passage culminates in an extraordinary Christological claim in which Bart suggests that the judgment upon the world alienated from God is indicated as at least a possibility in Genesis 1-2, then this judgment is actually executed only at one point in the cosmos. That one point is Jesus Christ, in whom God reveals himself to be, as Bart says, the one who really does and can leave behind this sphere. Indeed, the reading of Genesis 1-2, Bart pursues, shows itself to have been Christologically funded from the first. This is uh, the, the fourth of the citations. Genesis 1-2 speaks of the old things, Bart writes, which according to 2 Corinthians 5-17, have radically passed away in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So just think about that for a second. Genesis, Genesis 1-2 speaks of what Paul's speaking about when he speaks 
uh, in an account of the work of salvation in Christ of the old things. It tells us, Bart says, that uh, of that event from the standpoint of the first creation, let alone the new, chaos is really old things, the past and superseded essence of this world. So again, notice Bart reaches for temporal tropes when he describes the chaos as that which is denied by God's will and act, which belongs to the non-recurring past of commencing time, but which yet, inexplicably, also can become present and future and invading and menacing of the good creation, precisely as the possibilities neglected and rejected by God. Now, one of the chief effects of this discussion is to insist that discussion of sin, death, and the devil has an ontological as well as a moral register. What God does not will uh, is that which ought not to be. This comports with the, reason, with the reasoning that rules the devil entirely out of the sphere of creaturely being. Again, the question of the divine will and purpose is ingredient in the very constitution of creation as such, so that the creator's will and purpose is filled out Christologically from the very first. Or to say it dif differently, it is the inimical and abysmal nothingness that hurls itself at the crucified one, which has no place in the creation. The old eon, overtaken by the onset of the new creation in Christ, was already old and past from the commencement of creaturely reality itself, and yet absurdly haunts time and space, as it were. Now, the elaborate descriptions of the human being in sin that run throughout Barth's Soteriology in Volume 4 of the Dogmatics, to come to, come to, to the third theme, oft-times involves talk of nothingness and the devil as well. Here, as ever, Barth is clear that Christian soteriology is populated with, as he puts it, assertions which we cannot avoid if we are determined to derive our thinking on God, the world, the human, and evil from Jesus Christ. Save for, for the grace of God, the human being, as God's imperiled creature, is liable to fall prey to nothingness by falling into sin. Ontologically, sin shares in the invasive and finally impossible actuality of nothingness. Indeed, it is the noxious fruit of, as Bart says, the abyss and darkness and horror of evil, which constitutes the supremely present background of human existence. The invisible and yet supremely visible and audible and palpable dominion of nothingness over the human being, which in its unity could be called the devil. That's Bart. And so, when Bart elaborates the character of sin, he can write of it exactly again in the grammar of nothingness. And this is passage five. Um, to speak of sin is to speak of a power that has only entered into the world, as we're told in Romans 5.12. It does not belong to the creation of God. It can be present and active within it only as an alien. It has no appointed place, no place which belongs to it. If it has a place, it is that of a usurpation against the creative will of God, the place of an interloper. It is there where it has no business at all to be as that which God has not willed. It is there where it has nothing either to seek or to tell in its nothingness, it does not exist in any way on the basis of its own independent right, or even in its dreadful reality by its own independent power. How could it ever have any such right or power? It has its right, but it is stolen, it, sorry, it is the stolen right of wrong. It has its power, but it is the stealthy power of impotence. It exists and is only in opposition to the will of God, and therefore in opposition to the being and destiny of his creature. Notice again the, the, how, how tortured the paradoxical language is at every point here. The stealthy power of impotence and the stolen right of wrong. Like the nothingness that sin channels and the, and the adversary it serves, sin exists improperly and as the contradiction of both God and creature and not otherwise. It is fundamentally adventitious. It does not belong. It is fundamentally usurpatious, a rebellion empowered by the dynamism of God's enemy. Accordingly, Bart can characterize salvation in appropriately martial terms. And this is paragraph, or the, the sixth of the, of the citations. Uh, Bart writes, uh, God himself engages that nothingness which aims to destroy the human being. God himself opposes and contradicts its onslaught on his creation and triumph over his creature. God is wrathful against his own true enemy, which is also the true enemy of the human, when he is wrathful against sin. And the coming of his kingdom, his seizure of power on earth, is centrally and decisively the power and the revelation of the contradiction and opposition in which, speaking and acting in his own cause, God takes the side of the human and enters the field against this power of destruction in all its forms. That is why the activity of the Son of Man, as an actualization of his word and a commentary upon it, 
necessarily has the crucial and decisive form of liberation, redemption, restoration, norm normalization. Now these final four terms are, I think, interestingly synonymous for Bart, precisely because through the disorder of sin, nothingness attacks and unwinds the good creation ontologically. So God's re revelation of grace against nothingness is in one register itself a counterinsurgency against the adversary's annihilating disruption of God's goodwill for his creatures, hence restoration and normalization. While in another register, it is at the same time the overthrow of the absurd and yet actual reign of nothingness which bears down upon the good creation even now, hence liberation and redemption. One last comment b before my conclusion. There are intimations, I think, also that this theme of nothingness and the devil would have played a, a, a notable role in Barth's incomplete ethics of reconciliation, helping to give shape to the idea of the Christian life as a life in revolt against disorder. For in the midst of the contested creation, human beings are, Bart says, not only the field and prize of battle, but themselves the contestants in the divine conflict with nothingness, which began at creation. As one example only of the extensibility of, of this poetics of nothingness, listen to Bart writing about the Christian life and the provocation represented by the persistent ignorance of God in the world. This is the seventh and last citation. Bart says, like the devil, demons, sin, or in short, the nothingness to whose kingdom it belongs, this ignorance has no final power, significance, or dignity of its own, the ignorance of God. When it lays claim to such and seems to have it within its display of might and cunning, as Luther puts it, we should remember at once that it has lost this and has been destroyed in Jesus Christ. It lives only by what it negates. In all its forms, it exists only in reaction against the superior knowledge of God, which is first in the field. It is to be taken seriously within its limits, but only within them. We may not speak of an absolute, independent, or exclusive ignorance of God in the world. The devil would like to be sovereign lord of the world, but he is not. The ambivalence with which God is well known in the world and yet still most suspiciously unknown is bad enough, but not a reigning darkness, but this ambivalence, the shocking survival of darkness, even when it is overcome by light, this is the situation which gives rise to to the petition, hallowed be thy name. And it is against this that the required intelligent zeal for God, this is the theme of the, pas of the passage in Christian ethics, is directed. So here, as elsewhere then, Bart finds the grammar of his account of nothingness congenial to fund a theological redescription of the agonistic actualities of the life of faith. For these all involve, at their base, the devil's work. Part four then, the conclusion. My t modest task in the paper has been to reflect on Bart's effort to think and to speak aptly of the devil, paying particular attention to the more formal matter of the location of the devil as a th theological topic and to the more material matter of the conception of the devil as a third agent in the drama of salvation. I hope that the exposition and analysis uh, that I've offered has moved us a little further into understanding Bart's handling of these questions. And by way of concise conclusion, let me just puzzle aloud um, s about some things which have, may have come to light along the way. So in a 1954 essay entitled Theodicy and Theology, Jakob Taubes reflected on Barth's shifting patterns of theological dialectics. Taubes suggested that at the time of the Romer brief, Barth undertook what, what he called an attempt at theology without theodicy, which is to say, that he experimented with a theological discourse that refused to fall back again into the ontological pattern in which the reconciliation of contradictions develops from within the contradictions themselves. For Bart, at this juncture, rather than arising from imminent possibilities and necessities, reconciliation came, as Taubus observed, as a crisis upon a world that was, in Taubus' uh, uh, terms, out of joint, a world out of joint. Um, a crisis that was an event that owed itself solely to the absolute sovereignty of divine mercy. Now, Taubus himself was minded that Barth's thinking subsequently reverted to type. Um, as the incarnation, understood in his view as the foundation and presupposition of creation and reconciliation, came to authorize a renewed theodicy in the form of a grand, in Taubus's term, theological fugue of coordination that held the world to be fundamentally injoint once again. 
Now, whatever we make about Talbot's judgments, Talbot's remarks, I think, offer some suggestive language in which we might reflect on Bart's treatment of the theme of Das Nictica and the devil in the dogmatics. On the one hand, Bart's rather daring experiment in thinking of nothingness as an absurd and impossible third thing placed in irrecon irreconcilable antithesis to both God and creature suggests a continuing acknowledgement by faith of a world out of joint. It suggests also the limitations of any fugue of coordination, whether played out as providence or salvation history or theoretical theodicy of one kind or another. To acknowledge the devil as an increate and infinitely inimical surd, a reality never to be rationalized, never to be reconciled, never taken up and integrated constructively within the movements of God's saving work, is to queer the pitch of easy providentialism with some serious logical inconsistency, to be sure. The troubled character of the conceptuality of Das Nictica, not least Barth's repeated recourse to paradoxical formulations, reflects the permanent disjointed nature of the subject matter. As Bart once quipped in response to critics, if it is a paradox, this language of Das Nictica, it is used in the sphere in which paradox properly belongs. Namely, in that sphere where theology wrestles discursively with evil without the possibility of coordination. We do well to recall that it is the shadow side of creation that Bart finds taken up and har harmonized in the sublime providential music of Mozart, and precisely not the atonal noise and the deafening silence of Das Nictica. Well, Bart's discussion of the shadow side of creation quite readily comports with the labor of theodicy, and we've had discussion of this throughout, vindicating both God and the goodness of creation in view of the travails of creaturely life. The strict differentiation that Bart enjoins between all of this and the annihilating unreality of Das Nictica suggests that the latter lies permanently beyond the reach of any fugue of theological coordination. And yet, as we've seen, Bart also unambiguously extends divine sovereignty over Das Nictica by way of the coordinating discourse of God's left hand, of the opus daily, uh, dei alienum, of the productive potency of the divine no, and of the ultimate superintendence of divine providence. So how much tension is there here and how much tension can and must dogmatics endure? Does Bart overreach when he puts Das Nictica under the auspices of God's left-handed and improper work, suggesting perhaps that it is finally, if mysteriously, integrated and coordinated within the compass of divine providence? Creaturely sin and creaturely malfeasance may indeed be so encompassed. After all, creaturely existence, even in revolt, is the proper object of divine saving action in which God's alien no is ordered to the saving yes. But for Bart, God's way with nothingness has no reparative no reconciling and no redemptive aim. It is grace's pure rejection of the pure rejection of grace, the telos of which is that nothingness itself is brought to naught. It seems to me more, more natural that it would be right to say that God's no to the devil is not an alien work of God, but a proper work of God. Matthias Wundrich has insightfully suggested that we do best justice to Bart when we appreciate that he conceives of the origin of nothingness on the basis of its defeat, postulating it, as it were, retrospectively, a kind of backstory in election and creation for the outworking of the concrete divine triumph over sin, death, and the devil in Christ, to which scripture attests. God's first no to nothingness in election and creation and the final no to nothingness in the event of Christ's saving person are, cor are correlate Indeed, the first can be taken to be a reflexive intuition on the basis of the final no. The final no here is, of course, the salutary no of the cross. And faith lives in hope that when those things which have been accomplished are finally revealed, then God's yes to humanity will no longer be accompanied by God's no. The realization of God's opus proprium entails, as Bart says, the termination of God's alien work, which means that, as he says, where God no longer says no, nothingness can no longer exist. The ultimate vindication of the good creation by God of the gospel will leave no room for the adversary who was and could only be excluded from the beginning. So might we understand Bart to be striving more or less successfully to communicate the reality of divine sovereignty over evil without a final systematic coordination, which is to say without the intelligible integration of the truly negative within the divine economy, and so perhaps to be trying to offer us a theology without theodicy. Might the only coordination possible here be that of a divine victory that does not integrate, a divine unveiling that does not make sense of, 
and a decisive divine unwilling, which is utterly unproductive of further nothingness, an absolutely final judgment. Barth's claim that the devil is disclosed decisively at the heart of the gospel, and then only as that which is rejected, defeated, and ended, um, this eschatological claim could invite us, I think, to tether our thinking about nothingness very tightly indeed to the concrete events of cross and resurrection, constraining us to think and to speak of its antithetical reality under a rigorous dogmatic kind of ascesis that would resist the temptation for further elaboration. And so I wonder if dogmatic discussion of the devil might be disciplined to reflecting much more narrowly upon Christ's disclosure and defeat of the devil as, for example, an idol, a liar, and a murderer from the first, which is to say, that which exists only in sheer enmity to the Christ who is on the way, the truth, and the life. Perhaps you could work this out, you could imagine this being worked out along the pattern of how sin is worked out in volume four, sort of serialized across a series of Christological descriptions. Or perhaps you could uh, work it out as a rolling theological gloss on Christ's movement from the temptations in the, in the wilderness to Gethsemane and Golgotha and beyond. Um, the, the work of all of that would be an aid of ensuring that we recognize that we were, as Barth puts it, summoned and equipped to range ourselves with God as co-belligerents so that in our own place we might oppose nothingness and thus have a part in the work and warfare of God. It's an extraordinary claim, as Bart puts it. We noted in the introduction, Kruka's claim that for Bart, the problem of nothingness belongs in the context of eschatology from the first. As we've seen, this is because for Bart, the only theodicy that is ultimately possible, the only theodicy that finally matters, is the practical theodicy of the event of God's own self-justification in the victory of the cross and its final future manifestation. In hopeful anticipation of that manifestation, Bart invites faith to suffice with confronting the paradoxical, absurd, and unresolvable mystery of real nothingness in all of its devilish dynamism as something which is already overrun by God's saving act and determination in Christ. And as Bart himself says, and with this I end, from this standpoint, we see it with fear and trembling as the adversary with whom God and God alone can cope. But in so doing, we see where our one real hope against it is grounded and established. Thank you very much. Thank you.